Well, welcome to you all. Uh, let's crack on with our first question. It's Roy in Eastbourne. Hello, Roy. Hi, hi. Um, would, would the panel agree with me that history teaches us that the present government's reputation is now so, so low that it's actually beyond recovery? Uh, or, or, or do they think perhaps that the Prime Minister is in more trouble than his government? John Stevens, you've been covering all of these stories over the past week or so. What, what's your answer to Roy's question? Well, I think that this whole thing was totally avoidable. The Boris Johnson didn't need to go in to defend Owen Paterson. He's not one of his ministers. He wasn't part of the cabinet. He didn't need to do this, but he has done so. Why? But I think there's a slight loyalty. We know Boris Johnson doesn't like to throw people in front of a bus, but I think he clearly made the wrong decision. I think possibly he was badly briefed on how convincing the report was and how the wrongdoing was so clear on the part of Owen Paterson. But not only did he make that original mistake of going into bat for Owen Paterson, he's made mistake after mistake after mistake, day after day. And that's why a week after that vote, we're still talking about it. That's why we had the total joke that we saw this afternoon at COP, when our country's on the world stage, with Boris Johnson having to say, for people tuning in around the world who just want to say, Britain's not a corrupt country. I think that is totally embarrassing. And the only reason that we've got in this mess is because Boris Johnson hasn't been able to draw a line under this. He hasn't been able to say say sorry. He couldn't say sorry today. He sent one of his ministers into Parliament on Monday to say that he expressed regret on behalf of the whole government. Why can't Boris Johnson say sorry? I think that's the damaging thing and I think that's the thing that voters will remember. Brendan Clark-Smith, you must be tearing your hair out over this because it's exactly the opposite of what your constituents need to hear in Basselor, isn't it? Well, the thing is, I think we hold our politicians to pretty high standards in this country. I think if you look around the world generally, uh, we're, we're very transparent um, in terms of the declarations we have to make, in terms of if we do any outside work and so on, um, and in terms of basically what we expect uh, from our politicians. I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I've lived in other countries. I've lived in Romania and so on. Um, so I think when, when people talk about corruption... Um, I think it's because we have those high standards in the first place. Now, as, as John was saying, I think one of the big mistakes uh, from last week was that there's this idea about whether it's uh, the standards that we're held to or the system and appeals or the way expenses are done. And there's a, there's a place for reform there. But the problem was that that was conflated with the current case that was there. People looked at the two together and I don't think the optics were particularly good in that. And I think there's, there's a time and a place to discuss reform. I don't think that was it. Uh, and I think that was the biggest mistake there. Now, I read that standards paper. I was under investigation by the standards board myself fairly recently. Um, and it was something that was rejected, but something that took quite a lot of time. And although it was a very, very fair process, I thought, and they, uh, I, I felt I was treated uh, perfectly fine with it. There were a couple of concerns that I did have about it, and I think it's perfectly legitimate to have that debate. I don't think last week was the right time to do it, so next week I think the, the right thing has now happened is that that plan has been ditched. There's going to be another vote. We'll look at that Standards Committee report. Uh, I personally have read it, and I'll be voting to accept that report. You're being very diplomatic, but um, I imagine you were just as angry as many of your colleagues were last week at what you were asked to, to do, to be marched up to the top of the hill and then abandoned. And I've had uh, information over the last couple of days that lots of MPs have been to see the Chief Whip, and his reaction is, well, nothing to do with me, that I was only obeying orders. Now, if that's true, what, what a state of affairs for the government to be in where the Prime Minister and the Chief Whip seem to be, well, maybe not having totally fallen out, but there seems to be a problem there. But I think you need to stick by with your party in certain circumstances or the government wouldn't work. So you do need whipping and you do need to have that decision. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. And I know some colleagues felt very uncomfortable with the way that they did have to vote last week. Um, I wasn't uh, one of them because I was, I was away on other business, so I was slipped. Subsequent engagement? Well, that's the thing. I mean, people say is that a bit of a cop out. So I, I was I, I was in Dover actually looking at Border Force, and that's that's something I get far far more emails about in my inbox than I do about what, standards in and, and various other Seriously? things. Okay. In Bassett Law, yeah, yeah, it's Sorry, it's, it's, it's a very very I have big. I have a real problem with your constituency. <laughs> big issue, don't I? <laughs> Um, but, but but yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing, really. I mean, um, yeah, people are being the chance to get, 
to put this right now. Um, I know some people have said comments like, oh, people were told they wouldn't get money for the constituency or so on. I've not heard a single colleague tell me that. So I think there, there's, there's some element in truth people are frustrated, but I think it's maybe been pushed a little more than it actually uh, is in reality in. Well, let's just remind us of Roy's question. Does the panel agree that the damage done to the government by Sleaze is beyond recovery? Charlotte. Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I, I mean, this is not an isolated incident, is it? We've just learned about Sir Geoffrey Cox, and apparently he's been earning huge sums of money, around £700,000, uh, £800,000 as a barrister, whilst also working as an MP. So is his job as an MP... He's M- supposedly very good. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly don't earn that kind of money on legal aid, let me tell you that, Ian. Um, but, you know, is his job as an MP a hobby? Is his actual job a barrister? I mean, h- how are we going to draw the line here? I mean, this is not just one incident, of course. There's the sleaze concerning the refurbishment of Boris Johnson's flat. And then cash for peerages, apparently. Three million pounds, a cool three mil, and you can potentially become a Tory peer. Nice if you have the money. That doesn't strike me as a democracy, and it certainly doesn't strike me as a meritocracy. In fact, far from it. I think it's pretty disgraceful, to be honest, that this is going on uh, under our very noses, and the Prime Minister's doing very little about it. In fact, he seems very much complicit in it. Do you think, though, this is the sort of thing that really angers Mrs Mickens at 32 Acacia Avenue? Or do you think that if the stories go away after a couple of weeks, the whole agenda moves on and normality is restored? Or do you think that this might be a bit like the 1990s, where it was, I mean, those of us... Shara, you and I, I think, on this panel are old enough to remember the 1990s. And it was literally every week, every month, there was some new... Not, but actually more sort of sexual scandals rather mm. than financial, well, some financial ones too. And it, it was just a drip, drip, drip mm. effect. Do you think this is this might be sort of an ongoing thing or do you think that, well, it might be something that blows over? No, I think it could be ongoing. If you think about Mr and Mrs Smith down the road, their average salary is, what, around £30,000 MP salary average around £80,000. And then to think that they're earning £800,000 on top of that is scandalous. And many of the MPs have said, well, look, you know, my salary is just not enough to pay for childcare. So how about investing time, money, work in changing childcare policy so that everybody can afford it? How many MPs send their children to private school or public school? Where's the money come from, coming from for that? Certainly not coming from their salary, is it? To go to Eton, it's what, over 50000 pounds they can't afford that on their salary i think it's disgraceful now I, I, I you know boris johnson is seen as teflon i hope that this is the moment when we have a domino effect okay. um sure um we, we've seen lots of these sort of stories before do you think that that the, the mud will stick this time uh, this scandal does have legs on it it's got momentum even if you look at the polls for the last couple of weeks before and after the the actual exposure Uh, of Owen Patterson, you do see a dip uh, across the board in the polls. And I think it's not just whether the public do mind, it's whether they have a right to mind. They absolutely do have a right to be appalled. We have been here before. It can really precipitate a downfall of a government. As we saw in 2009, we had um, second homes allowances. Now we've got second jobs scandal. And what angers people, actually, is this sense of entitlement that when Tory... MPs are feeling besieged, you'll often notice that they talk about their career is on the line. Well, for Greens and for many in government, it's not a career, it's a vocation. And what people are seeing writ large is their very, true... That's being very pious. It, no, it isn't. I, I think because... people from all parties would say that, that they, no, that they regard no, it there as is a vocation. No, there is a sense of entitlement that, oh, look at these MPs with lucrative careers and previous salaries for going those salaries. No, that's not the case. What's happening here is that they are seen to be exploiting their position of influence and power to gain extra salaries. And it's showing up their priorities for what they really are. So there's the spirit of the rule and there's the letter of the rule. And even on the letter of the rule, rightly so, members' registers of interest are under the spotlight more than they have been in recent months. And I think we will uncover more corruption. There's the procurement scandal during COVID, ministers being linked to uh, those companies 
without proper procurement being followed. So these are not just standards that are being followed. We're exposing double standards. So that's why you think this standards. could be a sort of this ongoing could precipitate, thing rather than just a one-off. This could precipitate real okay. anger. Um, let's take an allied question here from Graham in Woking. You like this one, John? Do the panelists agree that the journalists asking questions? Oh, he's actually he's on the line. Sorry, I thought it was a text. Um, Graham, hi. Hello. Evening, Graham, yeah. you're, in, you're in Woking. What would you like to say? I was just about to read out your question, but you'd put it yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. The, uh, well, my question is, did the panel agree that the journalists who are quizzing Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, today, uh, should have been sort of more respectful and shown more respect rather than using the opportunity to catapult their own careers on a world stage so you think that the questions in Glasgow should have been just about COP rather than anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, I think even if you, you, you say, well, OK, the question should be asked, I think the BBC asked the question, and then that guy Peston came on, he asked the same question pretty much, and someone else, and you think, do you know what, this is... Uh, you, mm. why, do, why do the British uh, press always take the opportunity to run our own country down. <clears throat> John. I don't think any of the journalists were running the country <laughs> down at all. I mean, clearly they were holding the Prime Minister to account. And if the Prime Minister... But, but, it, but in the wrong place? Well, if the Prime Minister hadn't run away on Monday to that hospital rather than going to that Commons debate and had answered questions, then we could have dealt with that issue then. But we haven't heard from him since then. He took that train up to Northumberland to that hospital in Hexham. And so when did journalists have the opportunity to question Boris Johnson? It was then. I think all the journalists were perfectly respectful most of them asked a question about COP and then asked a question about this but Boris Johnson struggled to answer any of them um, Brendan do you have some sympathy with uh, Graham in working there? Well, journalists have got a job to do, and I respect that. And uh, you, journalists wouldn't be doing their job properly if they didn't ask those questions. So I, I think we all know that uh, you know you uh, you know you, you, live, you live by the sword. Uh, you know it's 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 part of the the profession. You expect that. Uh, with COP twenty six, yeah, you would want the focus to be on that. Uh, you wouldn't want to take away from that. But I think you've got to expect that you're going to get those tough questions along the way at the time. What I would say with the prime minister with the hospital visit, yeah, that's pretty important as well. We have the uh, the, the correct uh, minister answering questions there, Steve Barkley, that is part of his remit, so he was actually well, there for that. On, I didn't come think on, you're stretching that a little minister. bit, aren't you? <laughs> Jacob Rees-Mogg was the person that should have been, I mean, if it wasn't the Prime Minister, that would normally be the leader of the House of Commons. Uh, well, his house matters as well, and, and Jacob Rees-Mogg did deal with the with the issue before, and it it is something that is going to come back to the Commons. And the but I mean, he was actually sitting next to Steve Barkley, and you thought, well, if he's sitting there, he could have done this, that is his job. Well, he could have done, but Steve Barclay was the person that the government put forward for it because that was part of his portfolio. But I, I think the point is, you know, these questions are being answered. Uh, we are going to look at that report again on Wednesday. The issue hasn't gone away, as we've said, but I think with COP as well, there's been a lot of achievements that need celebrating. And it's it's just one of these things when we say about doing the country down, there's a lot of good things that have happened recently. So I know we do get the negative news, but sometimes I think we can cheerlead a little more for Britain at times. Quite difficult to think of any good news at the moment, but you're well Welcome to try and maybe ask a question on it if you want to. Uh, 0345 6060 973 if you'd like to put a question to our panel. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC. Earth
In this past eight on LBC, let me reintroduce my panel to you. John Stevens is Deputy Political Editor at the Daily Mail. Charlotte Proven is a barrister specialising in gender-based violence. Uh, Shara Ali is a Green Party politician. He's a spokesman on policing and domestic safety. And Brendan Clark-Smith is the Conservative MP for Bassett Law, not Mansfield and not Battersea. Let's go to your next question. It's James in Watford. Hello, James. Oh, good evening. Um, uh, a Cambridge academic has been blacklisted from Cambridge Union. It wasn't a Cambridge academic. An academic for, has been blacklisted from Cambridge Union um, after he did an impersonation of Hitler. Um, would Charlie Chaplin be blacklisted if he were around today for also impersonating and mocking Hitler? Yeah, and I think that's an important point to make. As I understand it, he was mocking Hitler. He wasn't doing it in support or anything and yet the Cambridge Union have decided to blacklist him and there have been various I think there was a letter in the Times today from somebody who said well can I please be blacklisted I don't wish to be invited to Cambridge Union if this is the attitude they're going to take. Um, Shara Ali let's start with you. There is a, a wider debate going on as we know with uh, Kathleen Stock for example had to resign her position at the University of Sussex because she felt she was being disempowered and harassed actually. The wider debate is free speech on campuses and this does speak to that question and what I will say is that free speech is not and never has been absolute. So if an organisation or a, a union even says this person, this individual has overstepped the mark that is a question of judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. And frankly, he may well have, whether or not it was done in jest. There are some things, particularly with reference to Hitler, for example, or the Nazi regime, you do have to be extremely careful that you do not cause offence beyond what is reasonable. But that is a debate worth having. But if you're doing it in a satirical or mocking way, I mean, that cannot be interpreted as showing any support for, well, a, even for the within Nazis. Free speech also <laughs> obviously extends to humour and satire, and satire has a very key role, actually, in exposing hypocrisy. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't discount that. But at the same time, we still have boundaries for humour, and we might say, well, that's in exceptionally bad taste. Um, you know, it's not a difficult. It's, it's it's not an easy thing to judge. It's quite easy to to misjudge. Actually, I think we have an escalation of deplatforming tactics. And what I would like uh, us to return to, actually, uh, within universities, that should be the key place where this happens is more free speech, more debate, and more contestation of ideas, which people may find offensive, but ultimately they do not have a right not to be offended. Although on this particular one, I don't know the whole detail. Um, yes, perhaps they did overstep the mark and um, the union did have a right in that case to say, we're not going to allow you to, well, to continue in that. Apparently John Cleese has also cancelled an appearance at Cambridge. Um, he says that uh, he had done a similar impression on a, Mon <coughs> excuse me, on a Monty Python show and he said he was blacklisting myself before somebody else does. Charlotte, what do you make of this? I mean... Look, free speech is everything and it's important that people are able to express their ideas, however divisive or divergent they might be. But I do think that there has to be a line drawn and particularly when it comes to Hitler, um, who of course slaughtered millions of Jews, um, which is catastrophic and people are still living with the consequences of that, generations still suffering with PTSD. I don't think there's ever a place where impersonating a mass murderer who committed genocide is funny or in any way at all satire. I don't think it has any place anywhere, let alone Cambridge University, which should know better. Isn't it difficult, though, because as John Cleese says, I mean, if you look back at Monty Python sketches, you look back at Not the Nine O'Clock Knees or even Little Britain, those programmes could not... In fact, I don't think the BBC are transmitting Little Britain anymore because there, there are various sketches in that which in modern-day Britain would not be acceptable. And there's part of me that thinks that that is just a tremendous shame. But then there are other programmes like back in the 1980s, Love Thy Neighbour or Mind Your Language, which I would say shouldn't be transmitted today. Yeah, I mean, I think in this case, though, we're not speaking about transmitting something that was decades ago. We're speaking about someone that performed recently in the Cambridge Union and thought that that was appropriate to behave in that way. And of course, we look back now on media, TV, films, radio, and we look at it very different with a very different lens. I mean, me as a feminist, you know, I look at some of the things that I used to enjoy, like in between us. You know, I used to find that hilarious. Don't, please don't tell me that you don't find that hilarious uh, I, I, now. I, I mean, I used to find it hilarious at the time when I was much younger. And now I, I, 
I watch it, and sometimes I still watch the old clip on YouTube because it pops up, you know, under... Uh, <laughs> you can't avoid something it. ...something you might enjoy. Uh, and I watch it, and I think, oh, my God, I can't believe I used to find this so funny. And I'm just absolutely dying inside, not only by how embarrassing the men are and how humiliating the whole thing but isn't is... isn't that the but point? the gender dynamics of isn't it, though... Isn't that the point, though? Yeah, but, I mean, the way that they speak to each other and they speak to women and how they objectify women is kind of very misogynistic, sexist language. But it's no longer funny, that's the point. I used to find it funny, I don't but anymore. But do you find it funny, and I'm trying to think of an example here, I mean, Sex in the City, I've never really watched, but Oh, I God, I love it. Yeah, but that's because it's a group of women doing the same thing as the Inbetweeners did about men. I mean, OK, not quite the same, not, but, not you, quite but the same you know what I mean. Not quite the same, talking about their muffs and, yeah, okay, you know, all of okay, that. OK, OK, it's 8 o'clock. Uh, I know it's 8 o'clock, we're not quite past <laughs> Watershed. It's not quite the same, but I watch Sex in the City and I think to myself, this is really dated. Why have we got these four women sitting around speaking about men? Is there nothing else that dominates their <laughs> life other no, than men? I clearly. Mean, look, <laughs> we like men. We're going to talk about them 24 7. Right. I hope not. John. Well, do you, I just got a question to Charlotte. I mean, do you think these things, you just don't want to watch them yourself, or you think they shouldn't be on YouTube anymore? You don't think they should be broadcast anymore? I mean, there's a big difference. Uh, of course, there is. I mean, if you're talking about in between us and sex in the city, <laughs> no, I think they should still be broadcast. I personally don't want to watch them because I see how dated they are now. So it's not something that I enjoy. That's the point. Something I used to enjoy as entertainment years ago, I no longer do because I think attitudes have changed towards gender, towards race towards even gay relationships and so forth. But I mean, in terms of, for example, Hitler and doing that now, no, I don't think things like that should be broadcast. I don't think people should have to sit and watch that. I imagine it's, particularly for people of Jewish heritage, highly, highly offensive and very upsetting. I think there is a much wider trend in universities that is worrying, though, that, and we saw the awful scenes yesterday with the Israeli ambassador. And We're coming on to that, so... So I won't mention that, but I mean, that's not... <laughs> I just, I just think you go to university to be challenged. You don't go to university necessarily to be offended. But I think we do have to be careful that we don't just go sweeping, just cancelling and blocking loads of speeches. And if certain groups of students want to invite someone, I'm not sure it necessarily needs to be a blanket ban enforced upon them by whoever that is running the student union. Well, look, I don't think anyone's saying there should be a blanket ban, not at all. And I think we're right well, to Cambridge say... Well, Cambridge Union, it, it's, a, it's a case by case basis. But if someone's going there to impersonate Hitler, or, you know, another horrendous figure. No, I, I just don't think that has any space no, at all the, in university. The problem is that it's a slippery slope, isn't it? Because, I mean, I, I spoke at the Cambridge Union last year, but they, I could come under this now. I would no platform were they, you in. Yeah, I'm sure you would. <laughs> I, but I really could no platform you, but I won't. But they could say, oh, he, he's a friend of Nigel Farage. We don't want him at the Cambridge Union because he's obviously a racist. I mean, it's, it, that is the slippery slope, isn't well, it? Well, I don't think impersonating Hitler versus being a friend of Nigel Farage are at all the same. Well, I don't, but yeah, if I, you look, I, I, I don't bet don't there are people, people who will do. text us now and say Nigel that they Farage are. Nigel Farage has spoken at Cambridge University. Dean in Swansea says, Freddie Starr would definitely be cancelled if he was alive. Well, rem remember <laughs> his impressions of Hitler. Brendan? So long as he doesn't eat anybody's hamster. That, indeed, yes. I, mean, I, th I think sort of the nail on the head part for this is it's it's some people are grossly offensive, some acts aren't particularly funny. Y you don't watch them, don't pay for it, don't view it, don't invite them if you don't like them. But I think when you're actually cancelling people, and um, mentor Nigel Farage, I remember an episode with Jacob Rees Mogg where he'd gone to speak to university and they tried to cancel him because he's a conservative, he's a Brexiteer, and all this, so on. So who, who is the arbiter of this and who makes the kind of the decision on it and I look at what John Cleese said as you referenced earlier and he's, he's, he's right in a way you know the impersonating something on its own isn't enough I think if it was grossly offensive and I haven't seen the act itself uh, maybe people can decide for themselves I mean, but the maturity's gone out of it Ian I you, think you could be caught under this couldn't you because I'm told that you compared taking the knee to a Nazi salute I mean that's an incredibly offensive thing to say yeah and, th and this is the thing Ian it's all about context so what I actually did with that and we were talking about the idea of uh, politics and football mixing I think I gave about a dozen different ideas about why it's not a good idea um, lots of examples ranging from you know, Robbie Fowler getting fined 500 quid for a t-shirt supporting Dockers to um, two Central American countries going to war um, the following week over a game. And I think I gave an example of something particularly awful that happened in the 30s um, with the England players performing something. In no way was it a direct comparison at all. It was just the general point that you shouldn't mix the two. And then of course some people say, I know, we'll pick the worst example you've given and the current thing and we'll say that you're comparing the England players 
players to this who actually thought what the England players were doing was very good natures and they actually meant to do the right thing there. I just didn't like the taking the knee gesture, but it's easy to conflate it. And again, with this debate that we're having now, you know, for all I know, it could have been someone who's very unfunny, who's done a grossly inappropriate impression. Uh, we, we don't know that, but just to ban everything... Um, you know, just like that, and to cancel okay. stuff, as as we've mentioned earlier, I think is the wrong route to get out. Sure, you want to come back? Well, uh, sorry, uh, just to be clear, so taking the knee is not like take, doing a Nazi salute. No, it's not. No, that's not um, what you said. No, no, it's not. No, what, what, what I actually said is I think that politics and football shouldn't mix, mm. and I, I doesn't yeah. say players shouldn't uh, say that racism's wrong. I just thought that particular um, particular symbolism I thought was quite divisive. Bearing in mind what happened with Black Lives Matter, and I thought there are better ways they could have expressed it. So rugby, whether you're linking arms, whether you have a banner, whether there is various campaigns, things over the years like show racism, the red card, which I'm very supportive of. I look at the bands players get for racism, which is still pitiful, I think. Mm. Uh, when is a player going to get banned till the end of the season? I've done online things about online abuse, Thierry Henry's done a lot of work on that. And you don't see a lot of action. And this is the point that people like Wilfred Zaha have been making, for example. And taking the knee on its own, I think it caused more problems okay. than it actually solved. Charlotte. Oh, I think we should quit while we're ahead on this one. <laughs> I mean, just going back to the actual question about the Hitler impression, I think we just need to remember as well how rife anti-Semitism is in this country. And, you know, doing these types of impressions can actually stir up the wrong type of people. I'm thinking about very right-wing people who are anti-Semitic. It almost gives them a platform where they feel emboldened and encouraged to engage in that kind of behaviour. In fact, I was on a train uh, recently on the way to Cambridge, incidentally, where I'm still an academic, uh, believe it or Second not. They job. Haven't, they haven't no Second pla- job. Second job, but they haven't <laughs> no platform me just yet. Still waiting for that one in my pigeonhole. But anyway, I was on the train and I saw the um, the um, Hitler symbol on the train. Um, it was quite big and it was in black uh, biro letter and I uh, took a photograph of it and reported it, never heard anything back since. But I mean, this is incredibly rife and you know, anyone that's on Twitter or does any online activism will see uh, we'll, we'll see this kind of nature of hate speech. And that's what I worry about when we start to see people who are in positions of power, who do have a, quite a significant platform, like at the University of Cambridge, and then are engaging in this kind of abuse or, or potential abuse okay. and encouraging others to do it. Well, we will move on in a moment, but to something a little bit related to this subject. But first, it's 8.32, news headline, headlines on LBC with Andy Ivey. China and the United States have released a joint Glasgow declaration on enhancing climate action in the 2020s. The announcement at the COP26 conference sets out how they'll work together to cut emissions. The Prime Minister insists the UK is not remotely a corrupt country, despite a string of sleaze allegations against MPs. Former Attorney General Sir Geoffrey Cox and Tory MP for Torridge and West Devon has denied breaking rules by using his Commons office for a second job. Ministers have condemned as deeply disturbing and appalling protests outside a London School of Economics event where Israel's ambassador to the UK had been speaking. Footage on social media after the debate on Tuesday showed police keeping order as demonstrators heckled her. LBC weather, drizzle and low cloud in central and southern England and Wales overnight. Clearer and colder elsewhere with a low of 7 Celsius. Tomorrow, fog slow to clear. Sunny spells, especially in the northeast and south. A high of 14 degrees. This is LBC.
Six, Charlotte Proudman, John Stevens, Brendan Clark Smith, and Shara Ali with me answering your questions. 0345 6060 Now, Levi in Hull asks on a text Is it acceptable for a foreign ambassador to be forced to flee to her car after speaking at a British university? Well, the ambassador in question is the Israeli ambassador, Sippy Hotovelli. I interviewed her about an hour ago in the news hour, and she was at the LSE last night, and she wasn't no platform. She did make a speech to students, but on the way, out there were lots of protesters there and there was some pretty unedifying scenes she had to be bundled into her car in the end so is it acceptable for a foreign ambassador to be forced to flee to her car after speaking at a british university charlotte proudman uh, no not at all i think it's absolutely disgraceful that this is happening in this country i mean as we said earlier i mean would a chinese uh, ambassador would they be um you know, caught up in this way when they were leaving, giving, having given a speech? Probably not. They wouldn't have to be bundled into a car, nor would they need security. And why is this happening? Merely because she is Israeli? Uh, and therefore a supporter of the well, Israeli government. It, it is legitimate for people to protest against a, an, a foreign state. Yeah, I mean, of we course. would have no objection at all if, they, if there was a demonstration against the Chinese ambassador or the Russian ambassador or the Burmese ambassador or whoever. Um, but it depends how far the demonstration well, goes. I suppose uh, that's the uh, yeah, point. Yeah, of course. That's why I was saying she required security and had to be bundled in the car and no doubt felt quite intimidated and threatened by that. Um, and to have to give speeches under those conditions doesn't really suggest free speech in the sense that maybe she might think twice before giving another talk somewhere else. And I suppose my concern is about why it is that she's being treated in this way. And is it because she is Israeli? Because mm. that is racist, if that's the reason. It's a legitimate country. Um, it is a democracy. Yes, there are enormous problems with the current government and the system. Um, but... It, you know, it's almost a suggestion that if you're Israeli, somehow you you're say, problematic. You say the current government, the government has changed. Netanyahu yeah, yeah. isn't there anymore. I, I appreciate so, that. In, in a way, people might have said, oh, well, we want to demonstrate against Netanyahu very right wing. Now, the current Israeli prime minister is possibly even more right wing, but he's in a coalition government, and therefore it seems to be a little bit more moderate. But, um, Shara Ali, what do you make of this? Well, I can well understand why people might want to mobilise and get very passionate or even angry about the policies of the Israeli government in particular, and then seek to target the ambassador. But I heard uh, the ambassador on, on your show earlier, and she sounded really shaken. And that's just not on. Because for those who want to maintain the moral high ground in politics, in their campaigning, the end does not justify the means. And what should have been happening, actually? And I've seen, unfortunately, again, and it does fit into our previous discussion, a, a shortage of proper debate. So whilst there may be a controversial speaker to some, we should be putting up and the universities and the unions should facilitate having a debate with both sides, so to speak, so we can have this discussion out in the open. And there will be uh, occasions when that's not going to happen. It's going to be a univocal speaker. But this goes well beyond... Um, what you might even describe as non-violent direct it's interesting action. It's because it's not non-violent. The, the Palestinian ambassador to London, he was supposed to be speaking at the LSE tonight, and he's decided not to. Now, I, I don't think he's actually given a reason, but whether he thinks it's because there were protests, it might be unsafe to do so, or whether he doesn't want to because the Israeli ambassador had spoken, I don't think it's that, because I've had both of them in the studio, one, one on one night, one on the other night. I, their predecessors I had in together. So th th both of them, they're usually up for robust debate. And that's what it should be all about, shouldn't it, Brendan? It, it should, Ian, and it goes back to civility and politics. And there are people in the chamber who I, I, I absolutely disagree with. Um, and I will stand up and I will say how much I disagree with them. But as, as we always say, you know, I, I don't think my opponents are evil or anything like that. I just think they're mistaken. And I think that's what we really need to go back to. And I, I agree with everything that we've uh, been talking about now. But we spoke earlier about anti-Semitism and uh, and the far right. I think there's a lot of anti-Semitism on the far left nowadays, which is is probably almost a bigger problem. And as you say, we see the, the flags waving outside. Why target one particular country? What What is it about this specific country that attracts all this information? It's, it, it is the only the only Jewish state in the world. And as we said, you know, what about China? What about uh, Saudi Arabia or Russia or all these other countries um, when we're talking about human rights or various other things? And I just don't think the same standards are applied. I Ask the question, why is that? Yeah, Ian, can I just say that in the 1970s, um, the Israeli ambassador was assassinated in this country, in the UK. 
So I, I think that really shows how rife mm. anti-Semitism is and perhaps how unsafe she might feel. Uh, and the other thing, on a day like today, which I only knew this morning because I read about it in a newspaper, it's the 83rd anniversary of Kristallnacht in Nazi Germany in 1938. Yeah. And when you say 83 years, you think, well, that's actually not that long ago. No. And I'm not comparing what happened yesterday with that in any shape or form. But it does give you pause to thought that the, that, that the motivations behind Kristallnacht, they are still there among some sections of not just our society in this country, but many others as as well. And it gives, I suppose, incidents like this do give us pause to thought. It's a bit like the West Ham fans on that flight, uh, and I hate to even bring this up because I am a West Ham fan, but the West Ham fans on that flight to Belgium last week um, chanting anti-Semitic things against an Orthodox Jew who was walking down the aisle. I mean, an absolute disgrace and quite right for the police to get involved. But those students there last night, they weren't there to protest. They weren't there to have a debate on the issues. The one thing that they wanted to do was intimidate and silence her, and that is clearly wrong. And I think it's just a total embarrassment that people went to do that. And there were messages circulating on Twitter earlier from that people had been spreading in the run-up, talk about how much they wanted to give her a scare. I just think it's disgraceful. And I think the police need to make sure that people like her are able to speak clearly. And I thought one of the encouraging things that came out of your interview with her was her at the end saying, I'm not going to be scared, I am going to carry on. I'm keep going to keep going to universities and keep speaking. And I think that's a good thing. And I think anybody that has ever met her, and I, I've interviewed her on a couple of occasions now, uh, once for an hour in this studio, she is not a woman to be intimidated. I mean, she 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 can rough it up with the best of them, as yeah, I found she out. she shouldn't have to, should <laughs> no, she? No, she shouldn't, no, yeah. nor should anyone. Um, let's go, Levi, thank you very much indeed for your question by text. We're going to come to more questions on different subjects in just a moment. Let's take an early break at 8.43. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from seven. Here's a collection of bad cops for you. Six officers to bundle a dying man to the ground and his crime was to have shown his rear end to a speed camera. They are so out of touch now, these police. In just a space of a couple of years, you've had these police who've decided to become political campaigners by painting their fingernails or wearing high-heeled shoes, sometimes deciding that they'd wear animal masks in an attempt to show solidarity against animal cruelty. That's not what police officers are put on earth to do. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
D.H. James says, come on, Dale. You know what's coming when you get called by your surname, don't you? What is the point of excusing the Israeli ultra-right-wing politics? What about the deeply disturbing position Richard Radcliffe on hunger strike is in? Yeah, if you were listening last night, we had a question on that, James. But uh, you can go back and check on Global Player or on the LBC YouTube channel if you don't believe me. Right, let's go to Ben in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Hello. Hello, Ian. Yes, uh, my question is... uh, with 214 new deaths yesterday and an average of 1,000 deaths per week from COVID, do they think the government is is actually uh, trying out herd immunity again? Charlotte? I don't think the government cares. I think the government's had enough of dealing with COVID, frankly. Um, I think the government thinks that they've put huge sums of money into the furlough scheme, vaccinations, amongst many other things. Um, and I don't think they're having um, a, a real and serious conversation at the serious levels of infection of COVID and the impact that's having upon the younger generation as well as the older generation. And we're entering winter and I think it's going to be absolutely dire as it was last winter. So, you know, you're speaking about is the government going for a herd immunity strategy? I don't even think they have a strategy. And if they do, I welcome uh, knowing exactly what it is. I think it's pretty damn poor. And I'm very worried about what's going to happen over the winter. My aunt works as a nurse for the NHS and I remember just how poor it was and how inundated they were and her working over 12 hour shifts, sometimes 16 hours just to get by. Um, and, and frankly, I just don't think it's good enough and I think we need to be really prepared for this winter. If you look at the figures at the moment, the infection rates are coming down, the hospitalisation rates are starting to come down and presumably are following on from that, the death rates will start to come down. Whereas you look at some other countries now, they're going in the opposite direction. So... Doesn't that count for something? Well, it seems to me, looking at the statistics, though, uh, COVID's very much on the increase during the winter. Um, And you see the numbers of infections just in London. And it's very serious, particularly in primary schools as well, with younger children. And I know that the government's encouraging people to have a booster of COVID. uh, And I think that's very positive. And I know that the government is working on making sure that care workers and people working in the NHS and so forth are also vaccinated and making that mandatory. I personally think that's a very positive thing to make sure that they are protecting themselves, but also other people that they're coming into contact with. But I'm really worried that we could end up with another lockdown. Brendan. It's not just about infections, Ian. It's about hospitalisations and it's about deaths as well. And we broke that link with the vaccine. And that's why I, I agree it's very important NHS staff get that. Um, I'm, I've had the vaccine. My wife's an NHS doctor. She's had the vaccine as well. Um, so I support this. And if you look at countries like France, where they've mandated this as well, they haven't had the drop in staff that people are saying is going to happen. So in terms of our plan, we absolutely do have a plan. We've got the boosters ahead. We know that every winter is challenging for the NHS uh, when we have a bad bout of flu that comes along it puts a lot of pressure on the health service as well we want to preempt that so we've got that we've got antiviral drugs coming um charlotte says that you know do the government care? Of course we care, but I think people generally are fed up now. They want to move on. We're not going to get to a stage where COVID is going to disappear overnight and we need to learn to live with it. And that's the steps that we're taking to help us manage to do that. Sure. If it wasn't for the extraordinary... I used to be a biochemical engineer as well, so I know how hard it is to get a product licence for a new pharmaceutical. If it wasn't for civil society and our tremendous scientists and technologists who are producing this drug um, at cost, for example, globally, um, we would be in a far worse situation than we are now. And we've seen at every turn during the COVID crisis and, and the pandemic, we've seen the government undertake a series of missteps and right from day one they they were just trying to see what happened and we had uh, scientists and ministers also following this idea of herd immunity until they were found out and just like with uh, this uh, corruption with uh, second jobs they have changed their tune due to a backlash when the public and when scientists but, realized but there were plenty of scientists advising that well, when they realised that they were, the public realised that they were being treated as guinea pigs, they weren't going to stand for it. And if it wasn't for independent scientists and if it wasn't for a change in direction, we would be in a far worse situation than we are now. But you will see at every point we had a series of missteps. Also in the medical community, it, those at the sharp end who were experiencing greater severity of deaths were those from black and Asian minority ethnic communities because they feared to actually speak out about the fact they didn't have PPE, they spe- they feared for their jobs and their livelihoods. I don't remember anyone not speaking out about not having PPE. Well, what this pandemic has demonstrated is rabid inequality in our society. 
And those at the sharp end who are suffering from social inequality have been most adversely impacted in care homes and in the medical profession itself by mismanagement of the pandemic. Okay, John? I think there's easy things that the government can do now, which mean that we don't end up with another winter where businesses have to close down. There's easy steps they can take, like encouraging people to wear masks. I'm glad that we finally got ministers in the Commons wearing masks, signalling to other people in the country that that's a sensible thing to do, not pretending that COVID has completely gone away, but also encouraging testing. I've just got better from having coronavirus. The only reason I found out I had coronavirus was I happened to do a lateral flow and it came up positive. If I hadn't have done that test, I would have just carried on coming into work, spluttering all over at people. There's easy steps like that the government can do before we start thinking about bringing in Plan B and starting bringing in vaccine passports and starting to talk about another lockdown. So I think the government should take those easy steps now. OK. Um, ben, what do you think? Well, they should have kept the easy steps like masks. And not just ordinary masks, but FFP3 masks or FFP2 masks, which... Uh, are being used in other countries uh, and they're being made uh, cheap by subsidy from from the government. Um, I think Austria is doing that at the moment. costs 67 pence instead of 4 quid. So they should have kept the basic stuff, not lockdown or whatever, but the basic stuff like like, um, um, the things they should have in schools that they don't have, the air conditioning, etc. They just don't have it. It's pointless having a having a, a monitor on the... So, the, so you the, effectively think they, the they, should have, they should have adopted the sort of plan B that people were suggesting. Well, I suspect we'll know whether they should have done that in a few weeks' time. Thank you very much. Let's go to uh, Jean in Blackburn, who's on a text. Does anyone actually care about COP26? I think that's the shortest question we've ever had. Um, Shara Ali, I know you're going to say, well, of course they do, you do, but do you think people are getting a bit blue <coughs> by it now? Well... You know, they may be reaching saturation point to some extent, but frankly, these final few days are crucial. Crucial in terms of the drafts we've seen. And instead of, you know, um, the Prime Minister being harangued about, you know, the, the, the sleaze, they should have been interrogating and questioning the commitments in that draft. And where did they actually mean the paper they were printed on? Because the real problem here is that what's great is that politicians from around the world are singing off the same hymn sheet. But this is a huge catastrophe heading down the track, hurtling down the tracks. If we do not come together as a civil society, as politicians, we see the youth converging on parliament and being sent home back to their schools. They are the ones, they are, it's their future that is at stake here. And it's those future generations who aren't around yet. But do you, do you take any encouragement from the news this evening that the US and China have struck an agreement on uh, climate change? And China, for the first time, um, I'm told, I think Caroline Lucas told me this earlier, has used the phrase cl climate crisis. I mean, that surely has to be a positive. It is, but there is a false economy here. And as we've got Christmas round the corner, where are a lot of our plastic goods and items going to be coming from? It's China. We're exporting our carbon production to faraway lands just to make ourselves feel better. So we need to crack this false economy of making our targets seem as if we're reaching them. But in reality, <laughs> the world is overheating like there's no tomorrow. We're not going to be reaching uh, 1.5 uh, at the current rate of level of agreement and commitment, which isn't worth the paper it's printed on, because the detail isn't there. It can't just be left to companies self-regulating. There has to be hard okay. legislation. Brendan, are you, are you groaning with tiredness about COP26? Well, we could have also mentioned about the coal-fired power stations in China as well. And, um, you know, I, I was part of a leaked-out WhatsApp conversation where we were talking about reducing our emissions and saying it's pointless if you don't bring the rest of the world with you. It's very much a global problem that we all need to solve. So I think people care about the environment. They just don't like being preached down to um, and told what they should do. Now, we're not all going to drive electric cars uh, by tomorrow. We're not all going to replace I, I boilers I'm overnight. Right, I'm right today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on the lucky ones, Ian. <laughs> I haven't got anywhere to charge it if I buy one. Then, but this this is the thing, really. Pe people do care, and there's some really good stuff that's been intro uh, introduced and announced. Um, the the 85 percent pledge about deforestation by 2030, the 30 percent cut in methane, which we know is actually worse than CO2 for global warming. So there's plenty of good stuff there that I think we can shout about. And having China and the US come on board is a, is a real major okay. step. But I think we at least have to try, John. If you look at the polling, there was some polling out yesterday, this chart showing 
where the public, whether they thought that the environment was the most important issue facing the country. And you look at the numbers and there was a, a remarkable spike and COP has clearly put it on people's agenda. But I think the problem for Boris Johnson will come if we don't get a success this week and who knows what success is or is not, will be, did Boris Johnson just engage in this too late? Has he put his whole heart in this the last year or so? Has the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss or Dominic Raab before her put, you know, gone around the world, done as much as they can to make sure that China actually signs up to this stuff and make changes? And I think that's where the government's been lacking. Well, because Alex Sharma, who was the Business Secretary, now the President of COP26, he has been flying all the way, right, way around the world and people criticise him for it. Charlotte? Yeah, wh- why wasn't it on Zoom? I mean, why is it that people flying you know, all around the world? You know, to if get you're to doing a law case, if you're doing a law case, it's you, online now. You, yeah, Ian. I know, but you want to look into people's eyes. It's not the same. It's like when we used to do this program on Zoom. It wasn't the same. Oh come on! I'm not cross-examining someone about murder or uh, rape. You're not doing that at COP26. You can deal with a, you know, a, a climate crisis, which is exactly what it is. If I'm sitting opposite the Chinese Environment Minister, I want to look him or possibly her, but I doubt it in the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, honestly, I don't think you you're really and you'll be back. Same. You'll be you'll be so far back. You won't be able to look at him in the eyes oh, and give him possibly, the evil stare. Possibly the case. Um, right. Thanks to Jean for that question. Final text question for the end. This is the one they all hate. Kathy and Brentford. Brendan Clark Smith was star of the karaoke night at Conservative Party conference last month. What is your karaoke song of choice? Um, Brendan, you you were singing, I think, weren't you? Would you like to give us a rendition of what you were singing? <laughs> Oh well, I, I, I suppose tonight I've been stopped collaborating and listening, but uh, that's 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 the nearest I'll go. But I did Vanilla Ice, but I only did Vanilla Ice because somebody else took Sweet Caroline Is off this me. Sort of ice, ice Baby, that one. <laughs> that's the one. That's right. the one. Yeah. I need to know that because Declan Rice sings it um, on Twitter sometimes. So is that is that your main karaoke song? It depends how much I've had to drink normally, Ian. <laughs> if I'm perfectly honest. So, <laughs> how much did you have then? Uh, well, not clearly enough, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, continuing the, the COP26 uh, theme, it's it's being said universally that this is our last chance to actually keep the prospect of 1.5 degrees C alive. So my song, which I think it's been universally rendered, is I Will Survive. <laughs> I Will Survive. Okay. Um, Charlotte? No, I just have as long as I have Weetabix. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably, I'm going to channel a bit of the feminist energy, girl power. So I'll probably go for Spice Girls if you want to be my lover. Which oh, I, I can used see to, you doing that. I used to love that as a kid, and I used to practice the dance moves. God, I love the way she said, I used to love that as a kid, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I feel old. <laughs> John? I don't know why you're limiting us to one song. I'd give you a whole set list. Feel free. Just to start with, I'd start with Spice Up Your Life, another Spice Girls song, get the crowd moving, get things going, and then work from there through my whole list of songs. But that's what I'd start with. Okay, well, I would be doing Backstreet Boys. I want it that way. Make of that what you will. Thank you very much to Brendan Clark Smith, Shara Ali, Charlotte Brabant, and John Stevens. We will be back with Cross Question again next Monday at 8. Coming up in a moment. We're going to be looking at uh, the fact that this week it's been discovered the identity of the first man to die of AIDS in the United Kingdom 40 years ago, almost to the week. We'll be discussing that and asking, what's it like to live with HIV and AIDS in 2021? It's one minute past nine.